Hello on four person, this is Anton, and uh, oh look at that, it's that time again. It's time to talk about Fermi Paradox. The paradox of not seeing any intelligent life out there, outside of planet Earth. Where is everybody, after all? Or the paradox of why is it that, after years and years of talking about this, Anton still does not pronounce aliens correctly. In every Fermi Paradox video, approximately 10% of all of the comments are about how I should be pronouncing aliens. Nope. I like my way better. And in this video we're going to be focusing on a somewhat intriguing explanation that some scientists refer to as information panspermia. A really intriguing explanation that does not necessarily solve the Fermi paradox, but does make some really intriguing propositions in regards to what extraterrestrial intelligence could be doing once they become advanced enough and once they learned how to communicate with everything else. But here it's important to start with a bit of a history and a somewhat brilliant Armenian scientist who most people don't know, but who's actually done quite a lot of work out there in a lot of different fields. This wonderful person by the name of Vahe Gorzagyan. A scientist who's done quite a lot of work on a lot of different ideas, including accretion disks around massive black holes, where he actually discovered quite a lot of things that we didn't know before, various stellar dynamics, where he even has a concept named after him, but more importantly, he's done quite a lot of work on cosmology and made a lot of propositions about the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, and at some point, based on these observations, started to theorize about the concept of information panspermia. Actually, before I talk about this, one more thing. Because this guy has achieved quite a lot. Apparently, he was one of the first people to identify the images of Halley's Comet on ancient coins, discovering some of the first images as portrayed by the ancients while also applying a lot of astronomical concepts in helping archaeologists work out various timelines when it comes to ancient civilizations such as the Third Dynasty of Ur. So definitely quite a prolific scientist that unfortunately most of us probably know very little about. But as he was studying all of this and as he was essentially studying the ancient civilizations, he started to ask a bunch of questions. For example, how would an advanced civilization try to maintain their legacy and not go extinct like some of the civilizations here on Earth. Or more importantly, how would some kind of a civilization try to preserve all life, especially if maybe the star system where they reside suddenly becomes unstable or becomes inhospitable to life? And relevant to all of this, he started exploring another concept. A mathematical concept referred to as Kolmogorov complexity. It actually applies more to computer science than to astronomy, but the idea here is kind of simple to understand. It refers to the amount of computational resources that are required to reproduce some kind of an object, in this case some kind of a program, by providing specific instructions. So let's just say I have some kind of a code, a program, that I want to recreate somewhere else. The example on Wikipedia kind of looks like this. Now even though both of these contain 32 letters, the program on top is much much easier to recreate than the one on the bottom. Because here the instructions can be written as write AB 16 times whereas the bottom program doesn't have any patterns, so all 38 characters have to be sent, and so the ABAB string has very low Kolmogorov complexity. It's much, much easier to recreate and does not require a lot of computational resources. And turns out, so is the DNA on planet Earth. Not just human DNA, any DNA. Because of repeated patterns and because of relative ease of description when it comes to a typical genetic code, DNA does not contain high complexity when it comes to this principle. So technically you could send instructions from one location to another to recreate the exactly same genetic code. And so that brilliant scientist, Gurzad Yan, argued that complexity of human genome allows it to be sent from one location to another without the use of too many resources. Actually, not so long ago, in the video in the description, we've discussed the recent updates in human genome and the discovery does suggest that the human genome is really not as complicated as we originally thought, and so the information stored here should definitely be transferable even using modern resources. And he actually argued that the information of millions of species from planet Earth could be sent somewhere else using a very specific algorithmic code that could then be reconstructed elsewhere, without the actual message being too complex or too difficult to understand. But in this case we're only talking about communication using radio waves and specifically instructions on how the typical molecule of DNA could be constructed somewhere else. In other words, this discussion is about some kind of a program or some kind of a file containing all of the genetic code from all life on planet Earth as a detailed set of specific instructions. 
and as this code is received, the instructions are read and the DNA is then reconstructed. Now his main point though is that we currently have enough technology and basically enough power produced by various observatories out there to be able to send all of this information without using too much energy. The actual data amount would not be too extreme and should be transmittable via radio waves. But the question is, who is it for? Well, so that's kind of where the argument ends, and that's where, I guess, speculation begins. Which is why this is known as information panspermia, or transferring life through information, and not necessarily a solution to Fermi paradox. But we'll talk a little bit more about this in a few seconds. And so the main point here is that, well, there has to be someone on the other end collecting the data and then reconstructing the DNA. With the assumption being that maybe some kind of a civilization out there is going to send a bunch of probes to various locations, possibly self-replicating probes, that are then going to create necessary conditions to, I guess, 3D print or just print out a bunch of life exactly as it is in the original location. And these would be essentially automated factories whose main purpose is to create new life in a completely different location by receiving radio communication from the home planet, with their main purpose being waiting for those signals in order to begin the production of life. And so the Fermi paradox part here is that, well, maybe these unusual probes exist everywhere, and maybe a bunch of alien life is already doing this to essentially reconstruct their own life elsewhere and to colonize other worlds. But that's a pretty big assumption. It assumes that these things are all over the place, and it also means that, well, at least according to Fermi paradox, at least one of these must have made it to the solar system as well. But the question is, of course, so why are we not seeing any of them anywhere? Where are all of these alien motherships with their genetic printers? With one potential resolution, of course, being that, well, maybe life on Earth was created this way. But that's very far-fetched and has absolutely no evidence. As a matter of fact, the genetic analysis of life on Earth more or less disproves this almost right away. The genome here is way too complex to have been created by a single printer. And so maybe this is not really a solution to Fermi paradox, as much as an explanation to how, possibly, panspermia might work for some of the more complex species. With the alternative, and I guess somewhat sad explanation being that, maybe a lot of civilizations reach a point where they basically send out these signals, hoping that someone out there will understand what it's for, and actually try to recreate their life in order to preserve it in another location. Or basically, all civilizations reach a point where in order to preserve their own existence, they send out these signals hoping that someone out there is going to be able to understand what it's for and reconstruct their life that might no longer exist on their own planet, for one reason or another. And by itself, that proposition is actually really intriguing. As a matter of fact, there might even be a way to test all of this by detecting various radio signals coming from other locations specifically targeted as a kind of a short message with potentially some kind of a code in it, powerful enough to be intercepted by anyone anywhere, and containing some kind of a condensed code meant for an intelligent species out there to understand, to reconstruct, and to then build on their home planet. Now, if you've been following the channel long enough, you might be asking the natural next question. Anton, isn't that fast radio bursts? Can this be FRBs? Hundreds and possibly thousands of which we receive every day from every location in the universe. So, on the one hand, possibly. On the other hand, Probably not, mostly because, so far, none of them seem to contain any kind of a message or anything to suggest that they're artificial and not natural. But the night is still young. As a matter of fact, maybe some of them could be these signals. Signals from ancient civilizations hoping for someone to recreate their life. Which, by the way, makes both FRBs and information panspermia sort of, kind of, super intriguing. So intriguing, as a matter of fact, that the Nobel laureate Roger Penrose has discussed this with the Armenian scientists in regards to his idea of cyclic cosmology. There's actually a video about this somewhere in the description. Gurzadian and Penrose, back in 2015, essentially pondered if it's possible for some kind of a super ancient civilization to not just send signals from one galaxy to another, but to actually send signals from the previous universe to this one. Or in other words, to send a direct radio message with all of this genetic information from the previous universe that ended to this one that's now going on. A kind of a cyclic cosmological information panspermia. A pretty complex concept, and also a concept that depends on the idea of the universe repeating over and over, and also obviously a very intriguing concept, but maybe not very scientific because you can't really prove or disprove any of this. 
And you can actually check out that video in the description to find out a little bit more about what I mean here. Despite being a cool sounding concept, there's just not enough proof or really any proof that the universe constantly has these big bangs and that the universe is repeating and cyclical in nature. There is however quite a lot of proof that the universe must have started at some point and will probably have some kind of an end. But the main point here is that this particular idea of information panspermia definitely intrigued a lot of brilliant scientists and nerds like me. And in my case, I actually started to speculate about something a little bit different. I'm sure a lot of people have speculated about this as well. In theory, a civilization can even reach a point where they can basically learn to manipulate matter with a lot of very specific radio transmissions. So kind of similar to how we manipulate water molecules inside a typical microwave oven in order to heat up our food. And so by working out specific frequencies and the way to manipulate certain matter, Maybe someone out there could just send very powerful, very specific directed signals to various locations out there that potentially contain planets with unique conditions where all of these signals can then start manipulating matter in order to start forming those genetic components, eventually recreating similar genetic code and thus starting life elsewhere. Now in our case, we're still very far from being able to do any of this. As a matter of fact, one of the recent papers just talks about how we can kind of use microwaves to assist organic molecules in synthesis of certain elements, but that's not really direct manipulation and definitely far from being able to create an actual genetic code on a completely different planet. But since we're speculating, I figured why not? Maybe hundreds or thousands of years in the future, it might be possible assuming that we continue our advances. And so this is definitely one of the more intriguing propositions, not just when it comes to Fermi paradox, but to the idea of panspermia or the transfer of life from one planet to another but in this case, without actually using anything physical, by just sending specific messages interceptable by someone else. However, whether any of this makes sense, or if any of this is happening right now around us, is not something we're going to know much more about until future investigations using radio telescopes and more analysis from scientists behind programs like SETI. And so until someone discovers something out there, check out previous videos on Fermi Paradox in the description below and watch out for the next one coming really soon. Subscribe. Share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining general membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.